Hello guys and welcome to the channel Jono's Graveyard Jaunts and today we're at Welford Road Cemetery and we're going to talk about arguably Leicester's most famous son who though not actually born in Leicester spent most of his life here developing the business into ultimately a global brand. He became known as the father of modern day tourism and of course we are talking about Thomas Cook. So we're on site here at Welford Road Cemetery which is in the city of Leicester and for our European and international audience and for those people who may not know where Leicester or indeed Leicestershire is if you just look at this map the, the part highlighted red is the county of Leicestershire which has a population of 330,000 and the city of Leicester is contained within it. So. The cemetery itself was opened in 1849, has more than 10,000 headstones and occupies more than 12 hectares. There are currently 35,000 graves on site and it is also a grade two listed site. There are no new plots on the site because you can see guys, if I pan around it's at capacity, but some of the existing plots are still being used. Thomas, Marianne, his wife and his daughter Annie are buried in one plot in the top right hand corner which I'm going to pan around now and that's the highest point of the cemetery which is over there. We're going to have a look at the grave shortly and basically we'll have John Cook who's buried at this lower level at the bottom of the steps. So Thomas Cook then, he was born in Melbourne in Derbyshire on the 22nd of November 1808 on number nine Quick Close. The cottage no longer exists, but there is a placard erected in his memory as to where the property once stood. And as we know, the name Thomas Cook eventually became synonymous with travel worldwide and the business went on to become a billion pound empire from its very humble origins in the city of Leicester. So Thomas then, his early years were very hard. He was the son of a labourer and his father sadly died when Thomas was only four years old. Thomas's mother remarried and she had two further children with a new partner, but he sadly died when Thomas was only 10 years old. This put massive financial pressure on the family. So Thomas then had to go out and procure work to help put food on the table. Thomas managed to procure work as a gardener's assistant on Lord Melbourne's estate at the tender age of 10 years old. The work was very hard, arduous, long days and Thomas often had to do six days a week. And his immediate boss was a man by the name of John Roby. Now John Roby was an alcoholic and permanently drunk. So this put additional pressure on Thomas, who often had to undertake his duties due to his intoxication and not being able to do any work. Thomas eventually had enough of this and decided to join his uncle John Pegg as a wood turner and machinist as an apprentice. But John Pegg also turned out to be a drunk and an alcoholic. So talk about going from the frying pan into the fire. This exposure of alcohol to Thomas put him off it and it led him to join the temperance movement. He saw alcohol as a scourge of the working classes and I quote, he believed it caused much poverty, crime, strife and wretchedness of life. When he joined the temperance movement, which is essentially uh, a permanent abstinence from alcohol of any kind, he met a very influential Baptist minister by the name of Joseph Winks and he influenced the young Thomas greatly. The temperance movement interests Thomas immensely and he worked very hard to succeed and progress in it as quickly as possible. He rose to the rank of superintendent and then by the time he was 19 years old, he became an itinerant evangelist minister. And essentially what this involved was going from place to place, town to town, village to village and spreading the word of God and temperance. And because Thomas didn't earn a great deal of money doing this, he basically had to walk because he couldn't afford the fare the horse and carriage. So the days were very long and there's lots and lots of walking involved. Now remember Thomas was a very young man at this stage and to give you an idea as to how much he walked in, in one year alone he walked 2,000 miles and he walked as far afield as Stamford which is in Lincolnshire a distance of about 32 miles from Leicester. 
1836, Thomas signed a pledge as part of the temperance movement to abstain from alcohol of any kind. And whilst walking from Market Harbour to Leicester for a temperance meeting, Thomas had an epiphany. He thought, why don't I organise a train journey from Leicester to Loughborough for a forthcoming temperance meeting? And this epiphany occurred to him on the 9th of June, 1841, halfway between Market Harbour and Leicester. So, on the 5th of July, 1841, Thomas organised a trip for 475 passengers from Leicester to Loughborough to go to the temperance meeting. And amongst the passengers was a seven-year-old John Mason Cook, who was Thomas's son. So the first excursion, he charged about a shilling a head, which he considered a very reasonable fee and was very affordable for the, at the time. And remember, this was a non-profit venture. And two months after the successful Loughborough trip, Thomas moved to Leicester due to it having excellent rail links to facilitate his travels and also it had better options for his printing business, which he was also running at the time. So Thomas organised further trips and further excursions and he eventually built a home and a temperance hotel on Granby Street in Leicester in 1853, which was known as Cook's Room. And this building consisted of a hotel, reading room, print works and booking office for his excursions. Marianne, his wife, became the hotel manager at the Temperance Hotel. He also built a soup kitchen to cater for the poor in the hotel itself. So as Thomas was basically trying to develop the business, he wasn't really making much money because most of his ventures this, this far were for non-profit as part of the Temperance movement. So had to have a serious rethink and he decided on his first commercial venture which was from Leicester to Liverpool which involved an overnight stay. Now Thomas as part of this negotiation process had to negotiate with four different railway service providers as they occupied four different railway company tracks and he managed to get them to sell him one ticket rather than having to buy four tickets which in turn he could sell to customers this making the whole process that much easier. And this was so popular that Thomas managed to sell 1,200 tickets initially, but this did not cater for demand, so he had to organise a further trip two weeks later for an additional 800 people. So in total, for his first commercial venture, a total of 2,000 people went from Leicester to Liverpool. And this trip was so successful that Thomas expanded the business and organised trips further afield to Europe and indeed America. And in 1872, when Thomas was aged 63, he was the first travel agent to organise a commercial trip for nine people to travel around the world, lasting a total of 222 days, the first stop off being in New York. When Thomas completed this global tour in 1873, he opened a new business premises in Ludgate Circus in London, and John Cook, his son, took over this business. Now, Thomas was 70 years old at this point in time and he was looking forward to retirement. And John and Thomas often clashed over the business side of things. Thomas was a philanthropist and, I remember, founded the business on temperance principles. And he was, wasn't, concerned about, wasn't so much concerned about profit as trying to help people and make travel accessible to them. But John was more, let's say, more business-minded on this and he's more concerned about profits. So the two are at loggerheads. And basically, in 1879, this led to the partnership between father and son not being renewed. And at this point, Thomas retired from the business. John took over operations completely. Now, at this point, Thomas had made, um, made some money and he built Thorncroft on London Road which, is, is, which was his retirement home, and it's just on the outskirts of Stony Gate in Leicester. However, not long after moving into the property, the Cook family were met with tragedy. On November of 1880, aged just 34 years old, their daughter Annie was found dead in the bath, and she died from carbon monoxide poisoning as a result of a leaking gas water heater, which was new technology at the time. Now, Thomas and Marion never recovered from Annie's death. 
and by 80 years old, Thomas was frail and blind, having lost both Mary and his wife and his daughter. And at 8 p.m. on the 18th of July, 1892, Thomas felt very unwell. He was having a stroke, and three hours later, he was dead. Thorncroft, Thomas's retirement home, is now the county headquarters of Age Concern and still exists to this present day. John Mason Cook, Thomas's son, only outlived his father by an additional seven years, and he himself died in 1899. Two years after Thomas's death, his son John commissioned the property on Gallatry Gate, which would become Thomas Cook's offices. The building itself was designed by Joseph Goddard. Now, as you can see, the exterior of the building was designed in the Renaissance style and contains four terracotta relief panels above the first floor arch windows, which you can see showing the various stages and the evolution of the business. So Thomas Cook moved into the premises in 1894. Let's go through the four terracotta panels. As you can see, the one dated 1841 shows the first trip from Leicester to Loughborough that Thomas Cook organised in 1841, where his son obviously went along and he charged a shilling per head. The second panel, dated 1851, shows the visit from Leicester to Crystal Palace in Hyde Park for the Great Exhibition of 1851, where more than 160,000 passengers went, thanks to Thomas Cook. The third panel, which is dated 1884, shows the trip of the Nile Exhibition that took place that year. And the final panel, dated 1891, shows the two major advances in railway technology, a modern, at the time, express engine of the Midland Railway, and the fourth bridge, which was typical of modern railway construction at the time. Now, when these offices are open, they contain a travel agent, a shipping office, and also a foreign currency exchange. And this bronze statue was erected in 1994 outside of Leicester train station on Campbell Street, where Thomas organised his first excursion to Loughborough from Leicester in 1841 for the temperance meeting. So here we are guys, this is the grave of John Mason Cook, who was Thomas Cook's son and ran the operations in Ludgate Circus, London. As you can see, he only outlived his father by an additional seven years. He himself died, John, in 1899, and Thomas passed away in 1892. In loving memory of John Mason Cook, so born Jan 13th, 1834, died March 4th, 1899, so he bringeth them unto their desired haven. Also in loving memory of his wife, Emma, born July, 17th, 1834, died Feb 10th, 1902. They are in peace, it is well. We're going to the highest point of the cemetery now to see Thomas, Marianne and Annie Cook's grave. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna walk up these steps and you'll see that the stones at this highest level in the cemetery are more weathered because they're more exposed to the elements. And I was here yesterday and it was very, very windy and blustery and I noticed it more so the highest level of the cemetery. I think this is where the oldest, oldest graves are. I'm not sure if it's anything to do with status or just age. I'm assuming because Thomas is buried in the top right hand corner, it's where the oldest graves are. I don't know that for certain, but that's the assumption I'm making. But we'll just have a look at some of the stones as we pass them and you'll see most of the writing is illegible because they've all been worn away due to exposure to the elements wind rain snow etc okay so here we are guys if you can see as i say look there's the the writing is very hard to decipher because most of it has been worn away due to the um, to the elements. So we're walking up here. Then on the right-hand side, we'll get to Thomas Cook's grave. And there's some very interesting inscriptions on Thomas's grave. I'd like to show you those. 
and read them to you because they're quite hard to decipher. I believe the grave is looked after by the Victorian Society and let me think, um, to mark the 150th anniversary of Thomas Cook's death, they did refurb the grave and just gave it a good clean because it was falling into disrepair. Um, but again, due to exposure to the elements, it is hard to read some of the inscriptions. So I'll just go over those with you because I think they're, they sum up. Um, it's a great epitaph for, for Thomas Cook and, uh, and a great legacy. And let's remember that this man really brought tourism to the world and he made it very affordable and accessible to the masses. And we have to thank him for that. The, the business lasted almost 180 years, which is staggering, but as I said, it sadly went into liquidation in September of 2019. But what an amazing legacy he leaves. So here we are then, guys. This is the actual grave of Thomas Cook. You see that with the sort of stone, um, you see the stone pillows there with sort of stone railings around it. That's Thomas Cook's grave. And we're going to go up to it now, guys. And I'm going to, to read the inscriptions on the grave because I, I think it's worth, worth having a look. So this is the grave of Thomas, Marianne and Annie Cook. So, all flesh is grass, grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of God shall stand forever. And this blesser is Annie, who sadly died at Thorncroft due to carbon monoxide poisoning. I think it says November the 6th, 1880, doesn't it? And here's Marianne Cook, and that's his wife. And she died March 8th, 1884. And there's Thomas himself. November the 2nd, 18, November 22nd, 1808, died July the 18th, 1892. So, this is what I wanted to read to you, because this is really interesting. Thomas Cook, pioneer of travel, founded, founder of the world's largest travel organisation, First excursion, Leicester to Loughborough, 1841. Around the world, 1872, he brought travel to the millions. That's absolutely true. So what an amazing legacy he leaves. And that, guys, concludes the video. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please like and subscribe.